everybody, my name is Michaela Pasco. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at Victoria University in the Institute of Health and Sport. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the stress that we're experiencing at the moment with COVID-19 and how that can have an impact on our mental health and our well-being and some of the things that we can do in order to protect or promote our well-being in this time. And I want to talk particularly about physical activity and about mindfulness. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the, the Bunurung, Wadawurrung and Woiwurrung peoples as the traditional owners of Victoria University's lands and to pay my respect to their ancestors and elders. So many people may be experiencing stress, anxiety, distress at the moment as a result of coronavirus and how it's had a very direct impact on all of our lives in one way or another. And we know that very high levels of stress can have a direct detrimental impact on our mental health and our mental well-being. So what is stress? Um, I probably just want to introduce the concept of stress a little bit before we start so we can sort of make sure that we're on the same page in terms of what we're talking about and what that means in terms of changes in the brain and changes in the body. So essentially stress is, or stressor, is anything that disrupts our sort of normal resting homeostatic state. And so a stressor, say, could be a car coming towards you at high speed. And as that um, car comes to you, the body goes, oh, okay, you've got to get out of the way of this. You've got to fight it or you've got to flight from it. Freeze is also another response. Um, and we have these very quick changes that occur in our body. We have increases in blood pressure. We have increases in respiration. This does things like send oxygen and blood to our muscles so that we, have, we can move more quickly. Increases um, or dilation in our pupils, again, letting in more light so that we can have the ability to see more readily or pay attention to the things that are going on around us. Non-vital functions like digestion slow down. So all of the energy that we have available is put towards this sudden burst of energy to help us get out of the way of this particularly stressful thing. Stresses are not just in our environment. Stressors can also be things that occur in our head. So they can also be things about worrying about losing a job, for example, or dealing with the difficulty of trying to school your children at the same time as trying to work from home and figure out all the technical difficulties associated with that or whatever other difficulties may be associated. Stresses could be things like social isolation during COVID or not being able to engage in our normal routine. So there's a whole lot of stresses that we're facing at the moment, um, individually and collectively, that can have a really negative impact on our well-being. So things like physical activity and mindfulness we know can have a really positive benefit on our mental health and well-being as well. And I want to talk a little bit more about that today. And I want to use the common Western uh, psychology definition, which is essentially paying attention to the present moment from a perspective of non-judgment and awareness. So let's think about what that means. Um, the first thing, of course, is being in present moment, not being in the past and not being in the future, which we all tend to live in by default. In fact, in terms of the brain, there's an area of the brain called the default mode network. It's called the default mode, no, sorry, the default mode network because it's sort of our default state of brain activity. And this, this particular network is active when we're thinking about the past, when we're thinking about the future, when we're thinking about other people, ourselves in relation to other people, sort of when we're in that daydreaming or resting state. So that's our default state. Very high levels of activity in this particular brain region is associated with um, mental illness. So people who have mental illness tend to have more, uh, more activity in this particular network. And we know that when we engage in a certain task or we focus on a particular task, that we engage another area of the brain. And that area of the brain decreases the activity in the default mode network. So when you increase activity in one of these networks, it's called the task-oriented network you decrease the activity in the default mode network. So when we are focusing on something in particular, we're deactivating the default mode network. And the default mode network, as I said before, is associated with poor mental health. So that can sort of explain perhaps why sometimes mindfulness can have an impact, or at least in part, can have an impact, a positive impact on our mental health in terms of brain, uh, changes in brain function.
The other thing I want to talk about is acceptance and non-judgment. So remember our definition of mindfulness was paying attention to the present moment from a perspective of non-judgment and acceptance. So judgment, self-judgment, we're all very judgmental all the time of ourselves, of other people. It's difficult not to do that, particularly when it comes to ourselves. Um, and we know that very high levels of self-judgment, the research shows that high levels of self-judgment are associated with poor mental health outcomes. So some studies show that war veterans, for example, who return from war, are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder if they have lower levels of something called self-compassion. And self-compassion means essentially what it sounds like it means. It means being compassionate to oneself. It means treating yourself as you would say a very dear friend. So rather than being self-critical with yourself, you're being more kind, you're being more forgiving, you're being more accepting and more compassionate. And we know people who have higher levels of self-compassion are less likely to develop mental illness. So the example I gave before was that you can have war veterans who have been in the same situation, exposed to the same conditions, and those veterans who have higher levels of self-compassion are less likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder compared to those who have lower levels of self-compassion. So it has a really important impact. And mindfulness as a key component tends to train and increase levels of self-compassion. The other thing, of course, we were talking about was acceptance. And that, of course, is a key component of self-compassion. Because instead of thinking something, feeling something, beating ourselves up about that, we sort of approach it with acceptance. We might say, okay, I'm feeling very stressed, or things are not going so well, or I'm not coping all that well, or whatever it may be, feeling frustrated, maybe. Um, but instead of beating ourselves up about that, we're able to sort of uh, be more accepting, less judgmental towards ourselves, more present. And that's another thing as well, to actually acknowledge what we're feeling experience that and not get caught up in it which is another thing that comes to mindfulness as well so when we're in the present moment and we're paying attention that means that we're observing our thoughts instead of being in them and getting caught in the rabbit hole and getting caught up in them whatever they may be we're able to sit and observe from a higher level I'm thinking about thinking i'm thinking that i'm hungry i'm feeling or i'm aware that i'm feeling angry or frustrated it's called metacognition it's the ability to observe our thoughts. And this is something that mindfulness is training us to do all the time. And I talk about training because it is training. It's like going to the gym and lifting weights. If you go once in a blue moon and you lift the weights, it's gonna be really hard, it's gonna hurt, you're probably going to feel rubbish afterwards and you're gonna think, I'm not very good at that. Maybe I don't wanna try again. But if you go every day, you get little gains and you can see changes over time and it can have an impact. And it's the same thing with mindfulness. If you try to practice it every day, you can have little gains and you can have, it can have an impact on our well-being, because it changes how the brain functions. It changes the structure of the brain as well. The, and it also can change how we respond to stress. So this pulls us back a little bit to what I was talking about with stress before. When we're very highly stressed and frequently stressed, this stress response, the fight or flight response is kicking in again and again and again. And it's associated with changes in hormones, one of which is cortisol. And we know that very high levels of cortisol can have an impact, a negative impact on the brain, because essentially when we get quite stressed, the way that the brain says to turn off the stress response is essentially that there's some receptors in the brain that the cortisol interacts with and these receptors then say okay the stressful event is gone we're safe we can stop producing these hormones to help us protect against the stress etc etc but when we're exposed to very high levels of stress many times over these receptors become less responsive to the cortisol or they start to function in a different way and it means that higher levels of cortisol are needed in order to have that same shut off response and very high levels of cortisol have also been shown to damage brain regions that are associated with the regulation of mood and emotion, like the hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex. Now we know that damage to these regions of the brain are associated with the onset, the presentation and the persistence of mental illness. So it's quite important to ensure, or as much as possible, that when we do feel stressed, that we're able to self-regulate and come down again and return to our homeostatic or calm state as readily as possible. So it's not surprising given all this that practices that teach mindfulness or promote 
uh, skills that build mindfulness are associated with improved mental health. So we see a few things. We can see in clinical settings that mindfulness practices or interventions that incorporate mindfulness, and this could be clinical interventions like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or acceptance and commitment-based therapy, or it could be things like yoga practice or structured meditations uh, are associated with improved um, mental health outcomes. So essentially we see decreases in symptoms of depression, we see decreases in symptoms of anxiety, we see decreases in distress. Now this happens across the board. These research has shown that it's beneficial in young people, in adults, in older people, even in children. It's beneficial in schools, it's beneficial in the community, it's beneficial in clinical populations. So that means that people that have a diagnosis of a mental illness and it's beneficial in people that are not clinical populations, they don't have a mental illness. So that's in that regard, it can be beneficial as a health promotion strategy, as well as a mental health intervention. There's quite a lot of research to show this. And some of the mechanisms that we were talking about in terms of decreasing stress is some of the stuff that I've looked at in my research and have seen that um, these practices can have an impact on some of these things we were talking about, these stress response factors. So it can have an increase on changes in blood pressure, changes in heart rate, respiration changes in levels of cortisol, for example. So practicing mindfulness techniques can be really helpful and beneficial for us during times that are very stressful. And I will talk a little bit more later about what some of these things we can do practically in our day-to-day -day lives are without having to become Zen masters. So the other thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is physical activity and how that can be particularly beneficial for our mental health and well-being at the moment. And I understand that um, there's a lot of barriers at the moment to engaging in physical activity in perhaps the way that we were before because gyms are closed, classes are not running, etc. So it makes it particularly difficult and also particularly concerning because we know that when it comes to managing and promoting mental health that physical activity is really important. We know that high levels of mental illness are associated with people who engage in less physical activity. And we know that engaging in physical activity is a really effective way to promote mental well-being and to treat mental illness. There's been a lot of studies to show that different types of physical activity are really beneficial and that something is better than nothing. So maybe you are not able to go to your gym and do high intensity interval training in the same way that you were, but you can perhaps go for a walk around the block. And in terms of mental health outcomes, as I was saying, something is better than nothing. And the research shows that. It's better to just do something. So I wanted to find uh, physical activity and exercise uh, because they're not really the same thing. So physical activity can be any bodily movement that you could be engaging in. So it might be cleaning the house, making dinner, and running after your kids, whatever. If you're moving, you're being physically active. Whereas exercise is a structured and a planned activity. So it might be high intensity, high intensity interval training or going for a run around the block or going to a martial arts class. Um, so I just want to clarify that there is research to show that physical activity and exercise are beneficial. So even if you're not able to engage in the structured sorts of exercise that maybe you would ordinarily be able to. You can still perhaps think about how it is that you could be more active in your day, how you could take physical movement breaks, how you could be doing something that um, around the house or around your backyard or even around your local community just to keep yourself being able to move and be a little bit active where possible. So many people may know that physical inactivity is a risk factor for many diseases like cardiovascular disease or cancer, for example. But what is less well known is that physical inactivity is a really strong risk factor for the development of mental illness. We do see that people that are more physically inactive are more likely to develop mental illness. And we see that physical activity and exercise are really beneficial for both mental health promotion and for the treatment of mental illness. So there's been research to show that physical activity is effective for decreasing stress, decreasing symptoms of anxiety, decreasing symptoms of depression, um, also decreasing inflammation as well, um, improving psychological, physiological, immunological outcomes. So the benefits are sort of across the board and uh, wide stretching. 
So there's a huge body of evidence showing that um, physical activity and exercise are really effective for the treatment and management of depression symptoms and anxiety symptoms. And that's in some diverse populations as well. And also different types of physical activity have also been shown to be beneficial. It's not like one type is better to the exclusion of all others. So some of the things to think about when trying to get perhaps motivate yourself to get a little bit more physically active or engage in some sort of um, exercise might be to think about how it makes you feel. Now it may seem obvious but if you like it you'll do it and if you don't you won't. So find something you like, find something that makes you feel good, you enjoy, you want to do. You don't sort of get up in the morning and dread going oh gosh I absolutely can't do that, I, I don't have the desire. If you don't do something, you can't get any benefit from it. And if you don't like it, you won't do it. So more than anything, find something that's actually enjoyable, gives you some sort of sense of um, achievement, some sort of sense of control, some sort of distraction if that's necessary. But mostly just feels good because we know that affect is a huge predictor to engagement. We also know that activities that provide some sort of sense of companionship and social interaction are important. And that's particularly important if we think about our current circumstances because relationships and social connection or a sense of social connection is also really important for mental well-being. So if you can do something that perhaps does give you some sort of sense of connection or interaction with other people that can also be really helpful. Maybe you meet up with a friend and go for a walk or maybe you put on an online class and you do that with somebody else in your household. Or maybe you chase your kids around the house um, trying to get them to do homework. I don't know. So what can we do in our daily lives? What's the take home message? Um, do something. Do what you can do. Be kind to yourself in regards to what you can do and try and pick some goals that are achievable and small. You don't want to overwhelm yourself and then just feel like it's something else you've got to deal with at the moment and something else you've got to put on your list at the moment of stuff to do. So instead try to find something that actually makes you feel good, something that you look forward to and when you complete it you can go, yes, I did that, great, I feel good about that um, emotionally, physically, mentally, etc. So keep it small, keep it achievable. Some ways to cultivate mindfulness in our daily lives might be trying some very small meditations. Um, there are some meditation apps available, a whole lot of ones that are free. You could try two minutes or 30 minutes, or 30 seconds. Um, 30 minutes may not be the best place to start. I would suggest not starting with 30 minutes. I think that that's going to be very difficult for somebody who hasn't spent a lot of time meditating. And um, also you can do things like just paying attention perhaps to some of the physical stuff in your environment. What are you seeing? Think about five things that maybe you can see around you at a certain time. Five things you can feel on your body. Maybe what you can smell or what you can taste. All of these things bring our attention to the present moment and help us uh, focus on the here and now rather than focusing on the past or the future.